Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Teleshadowing. We are recording this session and live streaming it to YouTube. We'll be having a Q&A session at the end, and you can ask questions in the YouTube live and Zoom chats, and they'll be addressed. I'm honored to introduce our mentor for today, Dr. Kavita Jackson. Dr. Jackson is a community ER physician in Maryland. She completed her medical training in Philadelphia at Jefferson Medical College, followed by her emergency medicine residency at Einstein Medical Center. As a mother to two girls who were born 50 feet away from her ER as a resident and a 2020 breast cancer survivor, Dr. Jackson is an active advocate for physician work-life balance and physicians experiencing illness. I would now like to request Dr. Jackson to start today's session. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everybody. I am just about to try to share my screen. It says it's disabled. My screen sharing is disabled, but welcome, welcome. Good morning, happy Saturday. I think it's Saturday where many of you are. Let me try again. Okay, there we go. I'm just pulling up my screen. So as I mentioned, I am a board certified emergency medicine doctor. I work out in the community out here in Maryland. Um, and I graduated in 2019 for some context. So I've been working as an attending now for oh, this is like two-ish years. So let's get started. And this is my email. I'll, it'll be at the end as well as my Instagram handle. Um, so just to talk about training in general for emergency medicine physicians, this is some basic medicine plus the additional training you need for emergency medicine. So this isn't the only path, but this is what I did. I went to undergrad for four years and I took my pre-med requisites during undergraduate. Um, I happened to get a BS in psychology and that's when I took my MCAT. I was at that time deciding between doing like a psych PhD versus medical school. So I had I did um, the requirements for both of those. And then after my MCAT, it wasn't the best. I took my MCAT two times and I wanted to, I needed better grades before applying to medical school. So I did a post-baccalaureate at the University of Pennsylvania. That's how I ended up moving to Philadelphia from Michigan. And I did that for two years. Then I got into medical school at Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia, where I went for four years, and then you start taking your board exams. So there's step one of the exam, then there's step two, you have CK, which is um, clinical knowledge, and then CS, which is your clinical skills. And after medical school, you are a doctor, yay, officially you just don't actually really know how to practice anything. So you have a training license and then you go to residency and this is where you specialize. So I did a four year emergency medicine program. They range from three years to four years. Um, and while you're an emergency medicine resident, you take the step three of your board exam. Once you are finished with residency, which I finished in 2019, then you are an attending emergency physician, and then you take written board exams and oral board exams, both of which I just passed earlier this year, and then you become board certified. You do start practicing as an attending physician before you pass all of your board exams, just because of the logistics and the timing um, of having to do all of that. And of course, with the pandemic, my exams were delayed because um, they were, you know, um, you have to travel for your oral exams. Anyway, details that don't matter. Then on top of this, you can do a fellowship and additional training if you would like. That's not required in emergency medicine. Half the physicians, I'd say about half do a fellowship and about half do not. Um, a day or night really, or weekend in the life of an ER doctor. So we do work, we do days, nights, weekends, holidays, you name it, we work it. We are shift workers, and I will tell you, no two shifts are the same. People try to understand my schedule so badly. Even my family members, they don't understand because I can't explain it. They're like, what do you work? Do you work on the weekend? And I'm like, sometimes. They're like, well, do you work Friday night? This Friday night, yes, but next Friday night, no. And in three weeks, I don't know. We'll see. So when I get to a shift, I show up, I sign out, which is transferring care of patients from the previous physician to myself. And then I start seeing my patients. And as you know, in the ER, we work on a triage system. So it's, it's not first come, first serve. It's whoever the sickest person is, they get seen first. Generally, when I'm on shift, I manage multiple patients. So about 10 plus patients at the same time I'm seeing. And overall, in a shift, I'll see upwards of 25 to 30 patients total. Now, mind you, these patients are all, they're different ages. I see two, uh, womb to tomb is what we call it. 
all the way from delivery and delivering babies all the way till the end of life. We see all ages, all chief complaints. So I can have five patients that have come in for five totally different reasons. Some of them are more sick than others. Some of them are getting um, imaging. Some of them are just getting blood work. So all different workups. And it's kind of a juggling game that you're doing. We make a lot of phone calls. I call a lot of consultants. Um, I call a lot of primary care doctors. And then I call a lot of admitting doctors for people that need to stay in the hospital. Then I need to communicate and transfer care over to another physician. Patient advocacy, all physicians advocate for patients. I think it's a particularly large part of the emergency department because patients come in we are screening them for any sort of life-threatening issue and anything that we get worried about, then we need to reach out and connect them with the right um, treatment or specialist. So we are doing a lot to advocate on behalf of our patients. No one likes getting a phone call from me because if I'm calling you, it's because I'm asking you to do something. I'm giving you work. No one wants work. And that's my job is to call you and be like, hey, this patient needs you and this is why they need you and advocate and push for my patient to get what I think is right and what is necessary for them. A lot of charting. Yes, all of us chart. And then dispo. Dispo is disposition. That means what's next. Where does the patient go next? Does the patient need to be admitted to the hospital? Do they need to be transferred to see a specialist? Do they need to go home? What do they need to do next? We're constantly thinking about the next step because as we're seeing patients, we're trying to move them through the ER. You know that waiting room it never stops. People are continuing to come in. So you're always thinking about flow through the department. And at the end of my shift, I sign out and I peace out, as I say, because at the end of my shift, I go home and that's it. I don't do any work beyond once I leave the emergency department. And that is something I really like about my job. Oh, let me get to the next. Okay. So what do we see? What the heck do we do in the emergency department? So we see everything. So any life or limb threatening emergency plus everything else. So this is just a breakdown by systems of some of the things that we see in the ER. So this is not what people present with. They present with chest pain. They present with shortness of breath. They present with fever. But these are the diagnoses that I'm considering in my differential, these are the diagnoses that I'm making. So you can see from trauma, cardiac, home, neuro, toxicity, psych, all of these are diagnoses that I have given. And I hate to say it's a short list. This is, but this is the short list. We really see and deal with anything. We do it. Now schedule, we were talking about schedule. It's really hard to explain my schedule. I am a shift worker, but it is not a regular schedule. So this is an example of, I think this was the pre-pandemic, I think January of last year. So this is just one month and every month is going to be different. You might notice some of them say, um, and I work in the community. So I work at two different facilities. Um, sometimes I'm at one location. Sometimes I'm at another location. The hours in one location, the shifts in that hospital are different than how the shifts are in the other hospital. And I work for a group. I work for USACS. It's an ER physician owned group, which is amazing, beautiful thing. I work an average of 120 hours a month, which does not sound like a lot. In residency, I worked about 100 hours a week, 100 to 120 a week. And now I work that in a month. But when you take into account the schedule, like if I'm working an overnight shift, let's say Friday night, 8, 8, 8 p.m. to 6 a.m., usually I don't actually leave work at 6 a.m. I'll work probably three extra hours into 9 a.m. And then my Saturday is gone. You know, my next day is kind of gone because I'm just sleeping. I'm recovering. You know, if I work a couple nights in a row, it takes me a few days to recover. So a lot of my time outside the ER, is just kind of downtime recovering from work. So 120 hours is not, it doesn't sound like a lot, but when you account the way the schedule is and the flipping and the flopping, it can be a lot. In my group, um, to maintain full-time status, we have to work a minimum of 108 hours, which would be lovely. But as you know, we have the pandemic. We are very short-staffed. That's not something we're able to do right now. Um, and I work an average of two to four nights a month. Each shift, it ranges from, this is eight to 10. Sometimes they're 12 hours. And all of this just depends on the group that you end up working with. Um, and then I'll work an average of, it comes out to about 12 to 15 shifts 
each month. So as ER physicians, we do not take call. No one will call me at home for any sort of work because I don't work when I leave the ER. That's how it is. I don't do my charts at home. You can, but I technically, my, my work starts when my shift starts and my work stops when my shift ends, which I really like because I leave my work at work and I get to go home and not think about work. We do have something called a Jeopardy or backup. And that's really like, you're like they call it on call. But what it means is that you're kind of on call for a 24 hour period of if things get really busy and they need an extra physician, you will get called. And that's not the same as taking call from home, like primarily other, you know, other specialties, if you're on call, that means for this 24 hour period, you're going to get all the phone calls that require a physician, a clinical question, somebody needs help, someone needs a recommendation or orders, or you need to go in. That's not the way we take call. If I'm on my backup or jeopardy, the only phone call I will get is if somebody needs help and I have to come into work. I take um, jeopardy, I think once or twice a, um, a month. Now, all of this depends on the group that you work with. ER physicians, we are primarily contracted out. So whereas, um, you know, think about hospitalists or internal medicine or um, some surgeons, they can be employed by the hospital. I'm not a hospital employee. I work at a hospital, but I work for, I work for a group of ER physicians that is run by an ER, like we own ourselves and we are contracted out to our hospital, which has, it has its benefits. And I, I, you know, I do like that model. So speaking of fellowships, after you finish your residency on the left-hand side, you'll see all of the different fellowships that you can pursue. You don't have to, but just ER is amazing because of all of the different things that you can do with it. Like we have ER physicians out in space, right? Like aerospace medicine. You can do international emergency medicine. I have a residency colleague who does that and she travels the world. It's amazing. You can do sports medicine and go be, um, I know people that will out with the Eagles, like they're sports medicine physicians. Yes, they have orthopedics, but they also have ER physicians out on the field with them. Wilderness, undersea, hyperbarics, um, um, EMS. So like ambulance systems and uh just all of the different things you can do. It's amazing. And then our practice settings, you can work in the um, an academic center versus community. I'm out in the community. A little bit, uh, the difference there is academics is you are attached to a um educational system like a school. So you have a lot of ongoing research, you have a lot of trainees, you do a lot of teaching, you have a lot of residents there that are training and learning how to do the work and your job is to oversee them. You also have a lot of specialists um, that you can consult within the hospital, like a lot of special specialists, like not everywhere. Like if when you go out into the community, you are doing all of the work because you don't have trainees. It's just me. And then if I need help, I have some specialists I can call, but I don't have the super in-depth, like I'm not I do have neurosurgery, but depending on where you are in the community, you don't have neurosurgery, you don't have OBGYN, you're delivering all of the babies, especially if you're very rural, you know, you don't have a lot of those specialties and resources. So you can pick, you know, there's a variety of practice settings. You can be based in a hospital like I am, you can be in a freestanding emergency department, which is literally a emergency department. And if anybody needs um, further assistance or like a hospital, they need to be transferred out. We can work in urgent care centers. You can work in a trauma center versus a non-trauma center. You can work somewhere where you're seeing pediatrics. So as a, uh, how my training, I am trained for both pediatrics and adults. So I see everybody. Some people only see pediatrics. Some people only see adults. In my hospital, we have peds, specifically peds emergency medicine physicians that work alongside us, but they don't have 24 seven coverage. So if they're not there, I will see the kids. Um, available support specialties. We talked about that. You know, if you're working somewhere that does not have OBGYN, be prepared to deliver all the babies. We have OBGYN. However, every now and then we still deliver babies in the emergency department. It just depends on the clinical situation. Urban versus rural, you're going to see different types of patients. You're going to be dealing with different um, sort of illnesses and pathologies and have different support around you. The way we get paid, you can have a salary or RVU base. So, salary is where like you have a fixed salary 
for the year, no matter how much you work, no matter what you do or don't do, you're going to get paid that salary. RVU is a little based on the work that you're putting out. So everything that you do that you document gets coded. And essentially, the more work or the more patients you see, the more you get paid. Um, now that we have advanced practice providers, those are APPs, um, you think about coverage. Where I work, we have both physicians and APPs, which are like mid-level providers, our nurse practitioners, our physician assistants. So they, the way my system works, it's beautiful. The physicians can focus on the most critically ill patients and spend our time there where our training is most useful. And then our mid-levels can see some of the lesser acuity things and we oversee everything that they're doing. But I think it's a beautiful division of labor. It works very well where I am and our mid-levels are amazing. Um, some places have no mid-levels and that's fine. It's just the variety of places you can work. Locum tenens is kind of like a traveling physician. You will get paid a crap ton of money um, to go work where physicians are needed the most. I just got a phone call yesterday asking me to travel for locum tenens and just for my lifestyle, that does not work. If I could, I would because you will make a lot of money. Um, going to work to the places that most critically need a physician and they don't have one. And honestly, airplanes, all right, let's be real. If you're on an airplane, first of all, this is like most physicians worst nightmare when you're on an airplane and they're like, oh my gosh, is there, is there a doctor on board? Right. It hasn't happened to me yet, but I'm just saying, if you're on an airplane and you passed out the person you want, it's me because that's my jam. That's what I do. <laughs> like I'm going to be the most useful person to you. So we are physicians everywhere and anywhere. How much money do we make? So this is the 2020 Medscape Emergency Medicine Physician Compensation Report. We fall right in the middle with an average annual salary of about $357,000. I don't make this. I work out in Maryland. I'm here in the Northeast area. This is very regional. If you go down to the South towards Texas, yeah, you'll be starting out about this. Like as a brand new attending, you'll be starting out somewhere like this. As you come up into the Northeast, for some reason, we like to bust our butts working and not get paid as much for it. That's just how it works out here. Um, our trends are closer down to maybe 200. So it's very um, geographical and kind of also matters. Um, generally, the, the longer you're working, your salary should go up, but that's not necessarily true. I'll tell you in my group, we all make the same amount of money, um, male or female, and regardless of the years that we've been working. The longer you work there, there are some additional benefits, but the um, amount of money you're earning, we earn the same. So the pros to emergency medicine is, it is um, when you see that schedule of 120 hours a, a, a month, despite the flipping and the flopping, there's a lot of flexibility. Um, I can kind of build my schedule. So I, I will not have a regular schedule, but I can make, I can trade shifts with my colleagues. And I do this all the time. I just got my October schedule and I'm changing, you know, sh sh um, trading shifts with my colleagues and we're very nice about it. And we help each other out. It's amazing. Like if I wanted to have a week free to go on vacation, I don't take vacation. What I do is trade my shifts out and I work my shifts around one week and pull out that one week so I can go do whatever it is that I want to do. And when I'm not at work, I, I do have a lot of downtime. So a lot of ER physicians are entrepreneurial people. I didn't know I was, but I am. I'm opening, opening a cancer coaching business next year. I've started obtaining lots of other different training, trying to get into passive income sources. I'm a writer. I get paid for my writing. Um, so I do a lot of things outside of my job, which is amazing. That's not what you have to be thinking about up front, but just know that you have the flexibility to do that. You don't have to do anything. You can just go be traveling the world or, you know, reading books or just sleeping a lot. That's another thing that I do a lot. You have a lot of flexibility outside of your work schedule to pursue other ventures. I also have two kids. So this is amazing for me. I get to do all of the parenting things that I want to. I get to go to all of the field trips. I get to do all of those kind of things that I was worried about missing out as, as a physician mom is not being able to go do things with my kids, but I get to do that. I just went on a field trip. I mean, now that COVID's opening up, you know, field trips are starting and stuff. So yeah, I just moved my work schedule around. I requested that day off and I was able to go. I worked the days around it and it was great. We, uh, another pro, we do a lot of aggressive 
things, like some of the most exciting things you see on TV. I hate to reference that, but that's the stuff we're doing. That's not the reason to go into the field. But what I like about the aggressive interventions is people come in an extremist, people come in very ill. We can do some aggressive interventions and see immediate results. So people coming in like sweating, oh my gosh, my heart, they their heart's beating like 200 beats a minute. It's a you know, they're in ventricular tachycardia. I can push them um, antiarrhythmics. I can cardiovert them, which is shock if they need. Bam, they are now back in a normal sinus rhythm, heart rate of 70, and they feel good. And you're like, you know, in that instant, you have the ability to make that a sort of impact. And it's really nice. I prefer that to outpatient care where, you know, someone has high blood pressure, you give them blood pressure medicine, you're like, okay, see you in four weeks, we'll check your blood pressure. And in four weeks, it's not better. So you titrate the meds and no, 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 no. I, I like the aggressive intervention, the immediate results and seeing that impact. We see a wide range of clinical pathology, as you saw from that list of the different diagnoses we make. We see a wide range of things. So ER physicians are often called the jack of all trades. We know a little bit about everything. We're not experts in every single thing. Like for instance, an ophthalmologist is an expert in the eye. They know every single thing about the eye. I don't know every single thing, but I know a decent amount of things about the eye to treat any sort of life-threatening emergency to the eye, as well as the head, the neck, the, you know, your chest, your abdomen. We know a little bit about everything enough to deal with life-threatening injuries or pathology there. We don't take call, which is lovely. And depending on your personality and your preferences as you go through your medical training, we don't have long-term patient relationships or follow-up. So I hope it doesn't offend anybody that that's a pro for me. That was just always my preference. And so I see it as a pro. Depending on your preference, that could be a con, which is why I have it on both lists. Some of the cons that may be evident at this point is we work in a very chaotic and unpredictable work environment. I think some people are getting a little glimpse into that with the pandemic of kind of what we're dealing with. And that's a, that's normal for us. I mean, pandemic is additional stress, but um, that's kind of how our life, our, our clinical life is. Sleep is extremely disruptive, as you can imagine, because we're never working a regular schedule. We're flipping from days to nights. One day I'm working at 7 a.m., one day I'm working at 8 p.m., the next day I'm working at 2 p.m. It's just all over the place. Um, we miss out on a lot of weekends and holidays and important events, so I try to make the events that I can, but generally speaking, I pick my holidays. Like I usually will have Christmas off. I don't care about New Year's, so I will always work New Year's. I try to get Thanksgiving and Christmas off because those mean the most to me. Easter, I'll work it, you know, just whatever it is. Um, burnout is a real problem for us. It's, it's a very high, it can be a high stress because you're constantly high acuity brain is working at 110 miles an hour or 110% constantly. You're very focused at work. So when I leave work, my mind is just, it's like jello <laughs> because you just, that's what's required to kind of keep up. So we can burn out a lot because you're just doing a lot of high acuity, high stress work. Um, and then a con for you, if, whether you like um, the long-term patient relationships or follow-ups or not, I will say sometimes with follow-ups, so we'll get a really critically ill patient I had the other day. Um, you stabilize them, you admit them, and then you never really find out what happens to them. So sometimes I don't like that I lose follow-up, but I will save my patients on a list and I'll go look them up the next day. Like, oh, hey, what happened? They're like, I talked to the ICU doctor, like, hey, remember that patient I admitted, you know, with all this crazy stuff, what ended up happening? Like, what did you find out about them? How did it go? You know, and then you'll find out like, oh, they did good. They went home or like, oh no, this other stuff happened and they passed away. You know, sometimes you don't get the closure of the loop of once people are stabilized and you move them out of your department, where did they go and what happened? But there's ways to find out. So emergency medicine is right for you. Now, don't get offended with this analogy, but somewhere we have we have this like loose understanding that if you can understand what an ADHD type personality might be like, that you're a good for, fit for emergency medicine. We all have some subclinical or maybe undiagnosed or diagnosed. Someone told my parents when I was a child that I have ADHD, so it's probably true and it makes sense that I fit in the emergency department. Um, we have some 
level of ADHD. We don't sit for very long. We have our hands in a lot of different things and we're always multitasking. So as I mentioned, we're jacks of all trades. We know a little bit about a lot. We have a lot of interest. For me, trying to pick one organ system for a specialty, I couldn't because it was just boring is not the right word, but it was just too much like, you know, like, oh, learn every single thing about the heart. But like, what about all this other stuff that's going on? Like, I don't think I could focus that much on one organ system. We are multitasking, you know, we're taking care of multiple different patients, as I said, different ages, different acuities, different workups, and you got to kind of keep that all in track. You have to stay calm under pressure and chaos because you could be looking at somebody's rash and then you have a cardiac arrest rolling in and then you have somebody who's having a stroke and it all just hits at the same time and you need to kind of you know pivot change of plans and kind of uh, keep moving and just adjust your plan and do the best that you can we have a lot of intense experiences i'll say some very happy happy, like joyfully intense experiences, as well as a lot of really sad and bad um, emotional experiences. And, you know, you, I think the worst is going from a cardiac arrest to, you know, then your other patients are pissed off as to why you were in this room for 40 minutes. And you were like, you have no idea what I was dealing with. And then your patient doesn't make it. Then you have to talk to the family and the medical examiner and do the death certificate and then go talk to some other patients that are really mad there for a minor complaint, like a toothache. Um, and they don't understand, right? They don't understand what you were doing and you can't tell them because of HIPAA. And that's totally fine, right? Patient privacy. Um, that, that, that's probably my most frustrating clinical experiences in the ER. We get down and dirty, okay? I have been covered in any, any, in every bodily fluid you can think of. I've been doused in it. My scrubs have been doused in it. Get ready to get like knees deep into your patients. You will do, or we do, whatever it takes to save our patients and whatever is best for them. So if you're, you don't like blood, you don't like poop, I don't like poop, okay? But I will get into it if that's what I have to do to keep my patient alive. You do, we do whatever it takes to, you know, do the best for your patient. And what I liked about emergency medicine, when I was uh, um, picking specialties, I was between surgery, OBGYN, and emergency medicine, because I really liked the procedures. Surgery ended up, I can't be in the OR all day, like standing, focusing, like that was just too much focus for me. Like within an hour, I was like, I need to move. I need to do something else. Then I liked OBGYN because we did clinical and you did some OR time. Well, in the ER, I can move a lot and I do a lot of procedures just at bedside without going into the operating room, without having to do the whole sterile procedure. There's nothing wrong with the sterile procedure. It's just that in the emergency department, when it's emergent, we just don't have time for that generally. So you'll just throw some beta dine down and get cutting. So we intubate people, cricothyrotomies, we're putting in chest tubes, we're doing thoracotomies if we need to, cardioverting and defibrillating, um, better known on TV is like shocking people, central, central lines, ultrasound guided lines, whatever it is, there are still procedures that we do. And so I, I like that part of my job. And it's right for someone who wants flexibility. Because as I mentioned with your schedule, you can have a lot of flexibility and tailor your life in a way that you can still have all of these amazing experiences, whatever it is that you want to pursue outside of your medicine career. You are not just an ER doctor. You don't have to be just an ER doctor. You can be an ER doctor and whatever it is, else it is that you want to do. And then the flexibility through fellowships as well. You don't have to be an ER doctor working in a hospital, right? That is one pathway. There's so many other things that you can do with emergency medicine, and you're qualified to actually do a lot of things outside of um, the medicine field as it is. So you may not want to be a traditional, I mean, I'm saying traditional just because many of us are like physicians in a hospital. You don't have to do that. You can go be in space for, you know, if that's what you want to do. So I can pause for a couple questions and that if we have some, and then I would love to do, I have two um, case studies. So let me know. Can I just pull up the chat? I think that we will ask our remainder of questions. Some students have DMD the questions. So we can ask them at the end of the session after our case studies. Perfect. So this is our first case. So 
don't mind my documentation. I'm going to try to break it down. If anything doesn't make sense, just raise your hand. I mean, I won't see it, but I'm sure they will tell me or just stop, put it in the chat box. So the case, um, this is kind of how you'll learn once you get to medical school, you got a good basis of your, um, you know, anatomy, physiology, then you start doing case presentations because that's what it is in real life, right? Like patients present and you get this whole long story, you get an exam, you get vital signs, you make a differential, and then you try to decide how to figure out what they have. And this is very, um, this is just, you know, all of medical education mostly is case-based. So first you have a 70 year old male who's presenting with sharp intermittent right flank pain, intermittent meaning coming and going. So in his right flank, he has no history of anything like this before. Nothing makes it better or worse. And he has not taken any medications for these symptoms. Review of system. So the first part, that's your um, HPI, history of presenting illness. Then you get ROS, which is your review of systems. He has no chest pain, no shortness of breath, no nausea, vomiting, no urinary symptoms like blood in his urine, burning with his urine. He has no fevers. He has no chills. Past medical history. He has a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, um, coronary artery disease, and diabetes mellitus. Past surgical, none. Social history, he is a tobacco smoker. He denies alcohol or illicit drug use. He's married and a retired teacher. Medications that he takes, he takes aspirin, he takes lisinopril and metformin, a metformin, excuse me, and he has no known drug allergies. So this is how, so in medical school, you'll learn, you'll get your HPI, you'll do your vitals and physical exam, and then come up with, come up with a differential. In the ER, I find it easier. I am already formulating a differential just based on that information that I've gotten. Before I've even examined the patient, I'm already thinking about this. And the way I was taught, which I think is the most helpful, um, think about the three things that can kill the patient now. That is my priority. That is literally my job to find those things or identify those things if they're happening. So that's why I prioritize those. What are the three things I'm most worried about that with this situation could be life-threatening to the patient? And then three other things that may be more likely, but are less lethal. So here's what I would love, throw it in the chat box or unmute yourself. I want to hear with a 70 year old guy who's got right flank pain coming and going, he's got a history of high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes. He's a tobacco smoker. What are three things this guy could have that are going to kill him? Acute appendicitis. Yes. Kidney stones. Yep. So these I'm going to put into our less lethal diagnoses. Definitely good differential. Aortic aneurysm, 100%. That goes in the three that can kill you now list. And there's no wrong answer here, okay? Even as now and as you go into medical, kidney failure, yes. Um, just know there could never be a wrong answer, okay? Anything is possible, even if it, it doesn't fit 100%. Remember, patients don't present, they don't read the textbook, okay? I've had some presentations, you know, that turn into something totally else. And you're like, how did we get from here to there? But you, you need to keep your mind open. Colitis, yeah. Yes, embolism, absolutely, infarct. Yes, that is in my three that can kill you now list. So I'm gonna show you what I have. So in the three that can kill you now list, ST elevation MI, you say, wait, why? That's up in your chest. There, so first of all, people, so STEMIs or major heart attack can present with a variety of things. Yes, chest pain is one of them. Abdominal pain is another thing that is more common in people that are elderly, people that are female, which he's not, but also in diabetics. So anybody coming into my ER with abdominal pain, who's like maybe 40 or over, they all get EKGs and I have seen it happen. So chest pain is not required for you to have a massive heart attack. That's a kill you now diagnosis. Number two, somebody mentioned a abdominal, a triple A, abdominal aortic aneurysm, specifically one that is leaking or ruptured, or maybe that's larger than it's supposed to be. That's a kill you now diagnosis. And mesenteric ischemia, that's when you throw blood clots from, you know, they could be coming from the heart, they could be coming from anywhere, throw blood clots off into the circulation into your stomach. 
it blocks the blood flow to your stomach. And so you start to have pain because as you, as your tissues don't get blood flow, they start to necrose and they start to die. And that is very painful. So someone said embolism, and I would put that into this mesenteric ischemia. Those three things are things that are going to kill you now if I don't identify them and intervene immediately. Three other things that are possible, but less likely to kill you right now. Could these three things kill you? Yes, but they're less likely to kill you right now. So he could have cholelithiasis, which is gallstones. Think about right flank, that's classic, or cholecystitis, which is a gallbladder infection. Cholecystitis um, with colo, um, colectomy, um, gallbladder removal, laparoscopic gallbladder removal being the number one most common procedure performed in the United States. He could have pyelonephritis, which is a kidney infection. Um, some people mentioned kidney pathology. Yes, absolutely, right flank. And appendicitis. Yes, so classically appendicitis is your right lower quadrant. However, based on where your appendicitis is, it could be um, what we call retrocecal, if, if it's like kind of pointing backwards a little bit, people come in with right-sided back pain. You can have also pain higher up. So never, I mean, although it's a classically right lower, I would not take that off your differential completely just because his, his pain is a little bit higher. Keep an open mind always. So on his exam, exams always start with vital signs. I would love somebody to interpret these vital signs for me. I will read them out to you. His temperature is 97.6. His heart rate is 101 beats per minute. His blood pressure is 78 over 44. Respirations breathing 24 um, breaths a minute. And he is setting 98% on room air. Yes, great. I think he's in shock as well. Essentially, is this good or is this bad? It's not good, bad, very much. This is not, these are not great vital signs um, for him. On his exam, he is uncomfortable, he's pale, he's diaphoretic, meaning he's sweaty. Yeah, I don't like that. His cardiac exam, so he does have tachycardia. We know he's got a heart rate of 100, it's regular, so that's something, okay? No murmurs, gallops, or rubs, his capillary refill. Less than two seconds, although he's on the shocky side, um, times four extremities. He's got two plus radial pulses, but his femoral pulses and his DP pulses are one plus. They're slightly diminished, so that's an abnormality. On respir respiratory exam, his lungs are clear to auscultation bilaterally. He's got no wheezes, ronchis, or rails. His abdomen is obese, it's non-distended, but it's diffusely tender to palpation. He's got rebound, excuse me, sorry, no guarding. So some signs of peritonitis and di um, diminished blood flow. GU exam, always do a GU exam. Oh my gosh, please. I know it seems crazy, but anybody with abdominal pain, do a GU exam. I had a case last week. This guy was like, oh, I have left lower quadrant pain. And I was like, sir, it was embarrassing for him. I think probably because I'm a female, I was like, sir, I need to do a genital exam. And he was all nervous. And I was like, no, I have to do it, right? Because you will miss stuff. So what he ended up having, had I not done his GU exam, I would have missed this diagnosis. This young man, his colon had herniated all the way down into his scrotum and it was incarcerated, meaning it was stuck. It was twisted and it was stuck. He was actually quite critically ill. And within an hour, he was in the operating room. So had I not done that GU exam, I wouldn't have picked up on that. So anytime people have belly pain, think about the chest, think about stomach or STEMIs, excuse me, and then always do a GU exam. Things from the genital, genital issues can cause pain in the abdomen or they start in the abdomen. And if you don't think broadly or go above the abdomen and below, you can miss some very critical diagnoses. Uh, okay. Neurologic exam, um, he's awake, alert, oriented times three. He doesn't appear to have any focal deficits. Guarding rebound, yes. So you'd be concerned about mesenteric ischemia, although one of our other critically ill diagnoses can cause that as well. Or like ruptured appy. So what would you like to do for this person? Mm -hmm. What are you looking for on x-ray? Yes, I agree with all of these. Ultrasound, CAT scan, yes. So I'm going to start with some basics and then we will get to imaging. Yes, EKG, yes. 
CBC, CMP, yes, absolutely. So basics in ER, IV, get them on the O2, get them on the monitor, get them on that cardiac monitor. EKG, yes, because we're talking about STEMI. That's like the first thing I want because if it's a STEMI, like nothing else matters. I know exactly where he's going. I'm gonna call the cardiologist. He's gonna be in the cath lab in five minutes. End, done. You do not wanna miss that. That's why people get EKGs from the waiting room. We get EKGs on everybody because if we see a STEMI, boom, we're taking care of it. Everything else stops and you deal with the STEMI. The lab, so yes, so I wanna complete, um, Blood count, you know, I've been using these acronyms for so long, I don't even remember what some of them stand for, but I want a CBC, a comprehensive metabolic, let's get the lipase. I want coags, type and cross, because I'm considering this as an OR type patient, you know, I want to get some pre-op labs for him, um, a urinalysis, troponin maybe, sure. Let's get some fluids running, and let's get some blood products as needed. So the thing, and, and then imaging, right, do we want to go to CAT scan? or POCUS is point of care ultrasound. And the only reason I bring this up, CAT scan is amazing, okay? We also call it the tunnel of death. You never send an unstable patient to the CAT scan because what they will do there is go into cardiac arrest. My most critically ill patients, although I want that CAT scan, I don't want them out of my sight. So also if they're gonna go to CAT scan, I'm gonna go with them. If I can't stabilize them enough for them to go to, you know, leave my site, I'm going with them to CAT scan. It has happened, <laughs> it has happened to me. Um, people I have gone with, you just know, you're like, oh my gosh, I need that CAT scan to get this diagnosis so I can call the surgeon, but they are so critically ill. No, 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 no. And certainly not an MRI. Our MRIs are in the basement. Absolutely not. If my patient is critically ill, they're just not going. So that's where ultrasound is a beautiful thing. I ultrasound, point of care ultrasound, meaning the bedside. I have my ultrasound machine. I will roll in. I will ultrasound everything I can. Some, many diagnoses I can pick up on ultrasound, like appendicitis, probably not. That's a very hard one to pick up. But if someone's got a ruptured appy, you're going to have some other clinical signs and symptoms. Maybe you can get an x-ray, you know, an upright abdominal x-ray, see that they got free air, and that's enough information to call your surgeon. Um, but that's where you just need to start considering. And then code status. Oh, it's, it's not a fun conversation, but when you have a critically ill patient, you need to at least bring up, especially if they're older, like, hey, what is your code status? Have you talked about this? Do you want CPR, intubation, everything? Like, and I say something to the effect of like, I, although I don't anticipate this happening, I'm not saying it's happening, but I just want to know, have you ever considered your code status? Like if your heart was to stop beating right now for any reason, what would you want me to do? Okay. You want that to be clarified. So, you know, if somebody goes, otherwise, if it's not clarified, we didn't talk about it and you're not, do not resuscitate, you're going to get everything. You're going to get everything possible. Point of care, I do it myself. So we are trained in emergency medicine. I had a robust ultrasound training during residency. Um, point of care is everything I do myself. So I have picked up <laughs> triple A's. I've picked up cholecystitis and I can call the surgeon without getting a formal or radiologic ultrasound just based off my ultrasound. I've gotten cardiac tamponade and called in thoracic surgery all based on my ultrasound. So we do that ourselves. Good question. So this guy, we end up doing an ultrasound. Oh, I realized, I don't know if I got my video. And what we're looking at here, um, this is an aortic ultrasound. And I don't think I have it queued up. I am so sorry. I wanted to show you this image, but this um, video. But essentially, this is an ultrasound looking at his aorta. So this image does not help as much. This is just a cyst here. But if we were going to do an abdominal ultrasound, primarily to look at this guy's aorta, because I'm worried about a AAA, ignore the cyst. This is an aorta. This is the spine. You're going to track it from his epigastrium all the way down to his umbilicus. Now imagine what the clip actually ends up showing. This is what a normal aorta looks like. This guy's aorta actually looks something closer to this size. So that's not normal. And I'm sorry, I don't have the video working. I'm not going to go out to pull it out right now, but um, I can send that in a, um, maybe like a link later, but this guy got ultrasounded and a pearl. So a fast, a focus assessments on a graphically of trauma um, will be negative. So when you're doing a fast exam, mostly in our traumatic 
patients or patients that were worried that they're bleeding out or have um, free fluid in their abdomen, we do a quick, we do a right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, we do a mild echo, and then we do over their bladder looking for free fluid. All done at the bedside point of care ultrasound. And if you see free fluid, that's free reigns to call your surgeon and say, hey, we have free fluid. If they're critically ill, they don't go to CAT scan, they go straight to the OR. OR. So if you have a ruptured triple A, the aorta, if you remember, is actually a retroperitoneal organ. So you will not see free fluid in the abdomen. You can, but just because your fast is negative, it does not rule out a ruptured triple A because that fluid is actually going into the retroperitoneum, not into the peritoneal cavity where you, your, your fast exam is actually um, looking for free fluid. So this guy ends up having an abdominal aortic aneurysm, one that we are concerned is ruptured or leaking. So a normal um, a aorta, well, you get, it should be less than three centimeters. And once it splits into the internal iliacs, it should be less than one and a half centimeters. So anything more than that is considered a aortic aneurysm. Surgery is indicated um, in men for an aorta greater than five and a half centimeters and for females um, aorta more than five centimeters. And this is like asymptomatic, just regular. Um, it's pretty rare, like four and a half people per a thousand and the majority are inferior to your renal arteries. So risk factors, many of which our patient actually had, atherosclerosis, smoking, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, being male, higher age, and then some of the um, genetic um, diseases that cause, like connective tissue disorders, so Marfan syndrome, um, Ehlers-Danlos, and there is a screening system in place for this. There's a one-time ultrasound for any man over the age of 65 who has ever smoked. They are supposed to be getting an abdominal ultrasound just to screen them for um, an aneurysm. So the classic triad, right? This is your like textbook exam. Is somebody's that you're gonna have somebody like a 75 year old smoker with heart disease, diabetes and cholesterol or whatever, coming in with this triad of back pain, hypotension, and a pulsatile abdominal mass. So I'll tell you in real life, only maybe half of the patients actually present with this. And it's so hard to identify this sometimes, even though it's a critically ill, you know, this is a very important diagnosis. A third of people are misdiagnosed initially, actually. And people can come in with all sorts of things. They can come in with abdominal pain. They can come in with syncope, which is passing out. So remember, you need to always have, you know, think broadly and have an eye high index of suspicion. So the imaging, the gold standard, meaning the best imaging for that you can get is a CT angiography of the abdomen pelvis. So you want that arterial phase of contrast of the abdomen and pelvis. And that I put stable there because that is a stable patient, right? We talked, we had this conversation already about who is okay to go to CAT scan and who is not. An unstable patient, I'll throw my ultrasound onto there and I can measure, you know, I can tell if they've got free fluid. Although I remember not having free fluid does not rule out a triple A. Then you talk about management and it really depends on their, whether they're having symptoms and how stable they are. So for this patient who is symptomatic, right, he's coming in with pain and he's unstable, he's clinically in shock, you call vascular surgery right away and he rolls up to the OR stat. That is the definitive management. He needs to be opened up. He needs surgery to um, fix this problem and he needs it now. Um, so in the emergency department, what I would do for him, we talked about some of our basics, we get large board IVs, I'm talking like a 16, a 14 gauge, get oxygen on him, you want to maximize his oxygenation, have him on the cardiac monitor, hemodynamic support, meaning helping his blood pressure fluids. And if you're concerned, he's bleeding out into his um, belly, the best thing you can do for him is give him blood, support him with blood. There is something called permissive hypotension, this is getting into like the next level um, discussion, but like we're patients are allowed to be a little hypotense. We don't need to be super aggressive and bring his blood pressure up to 140 because if you think about it pathophysiologically, if you start putting him on pressors and bringing his blood pressure to like 120 to like normal, you're actually also increasing the pressure in the aorta that you is are concerned is leaking and it's actually going to worsen your leak or worsen their bleed. So you want to have 
you know, and, and I, they've done studies where out people do just as fine with a little bit of hypotension. So you can let his blood pressure be on the soft side, make sure you are supporting it, but that he's still perfusing the best that he can. You don't want him to drop, you know, down into the shock kind of level. You want to keep him above shock, but not be too aggressive with it. And then of course, pain control. Expected management means if I did nothing for this person, right, he's going to die. It's just that simple. This is universally fatal. Nobody, you know, it's not like, I'm trying to think of an example of something like, you know, if you had a cold, right, and we didn't treat it with any Tylenol or ibuprofen, you're going to be just fine. This person will not. If he doesn't get, you know, treatment, he's going to die. Now, somebody who's symptomatic, let's say like someone comes in, this same guy, he's like, oh, I kind of have some abdominal pain, um, but he's got really good vital signs. He's not in shock. And I find out on his CAT scan, like, oh, he's got an eight centimeter aorta. It's not ruptured. It's not leaking. I still call vascular surgery. He doesn't need to go to the operating room right now. But um, I had this case earlier this week, actually, eight centimeter aorta. He'll get admitted and they'll probably fix it tomorrow on a more urgent but non-emergent basis. And that's reasonable. Or they'll, yeah, you know. Now let's say it's incidental, okay? Somebody came in, they end up having some other issue and we happen to find this aorta, like not that we were looking for, it doesn't even match up with the symptoms that they came in for, it, that's what incidental is, right? Like we just found this thing. I would set them up, you know, and let's say like it's six centimeters, okay? It's not eight or nine centimeters, right? It's six centimeters. They have no symptoms. They look great. They can go see vascular surgery as an outpatient um, and probably have it scheduled for repair within the next month. So management, it really depends on the clinical situation. So another clinical pearl for you, anybody who has rectal bleeding and they have previously had their aorta repaired, this is an aorta duodenal fistula until otherwise proven. I've seen it once. The patient didn't even make it to the OR. He just, it was really sad because he knew what was happening. He looked at me, it's like, am I gonna die? And this is one of those moments where I was like, you know, I don't like to lie, but who's gonna say that? Like, who's gonna say, you know, I said no. And I firmly, I didn't think he would because like we had the surgeon on board, the OR was getting prepped and just in that moment, he never ended up making it to the operating room. He coded and he um, passed away. So anybody who's ever had a triple A repaired before from any one of these clinical situations, if they come in with rectal bleeding, sometimes they have what we call as a herald bleed. They have a little bit of like GI bleed or a little blood per rectum. It doesn't seem that serious. No, that's the herald bleed. That means that bleed, the serious bleed, it is coming. You take that seriously, stop the shot, call the vascular surgeon, get him to the operating room because he's about to exsanguinate out of his rectum. The aorta and the duodenum have made a fistula and essentially then the aorta, all that blood going to your lower body, it's going to start pouring out the duodenum coming out his GI system. And that's how it ends up being a GI bleed. Um, yeah, like I said, I've seen it once and it was, it was horrendous. Any questions about that case before we go on to the second one? I think we're good. Okay. So just a contrast with this, that could be room one. And then room two is this three-year-old. He's brought in by EMS and mom. He's had some shortness of breath for the last three days, progressively worsening. He's got some rhinorrhea, runny nose, sneezing, throat pain, a little bit of a cough. This is not COVID. We're not doing COVID today. <laughs> I'm just going to say. Um, he's got no fevers or chills. No one around him is sick. He did run out of his asthma meds and his inhaler. Um, he's an asthmatic. He ran out of his meds a month ago. He can't get an appointment with the pediatrician. His vaccines are up to date, including his flu vaccine. Remember, we're getting into flu season, so go get your vaccines. He's never been intubated, um, and the last asthma attack was one month ago. His medical history, so he does have asthma, eczema, and a peanut allergy. He's had no surgeries in the past. Social history, he's in preschool. He lives with mom who does smoke. He lives with um, dad and an older brother. He takes Zyrtec, Flovent, Albuterol, and he's got no known drug allergies. 
So let's build a differential for this guy, a three-year-old asthmatic coming in with some shortness of breath. Three things that can kill him now and three other less lethal diagnoses. I'm gonna to look to the chat box. What do you got guys? What are we worried about? Yep, pleural effusion. Yes, pneumonia, and I also see pneuma, which could be pneumo, right? Pneumothorax as well. Absolutely, that's a kill you now diagnosis. Pneumonia kind of goes into both lists depending on how critically ill you are. 100% inhaled something that is now stuck in his lungs. Yes, like he aspirated something. Absolutely, especially for a kid. Foreign body, yes, yes. These are awesome. I'm going to show you mine. So that's ex asthma exacerbation. Yes, most people do okay, but asthma exacerbation is, yes. Yep, number two, anaphylaxis. Who I'm seeing, Fizza, you're absolutely right. Accidentally took peanuts. Anaphylaxis, that's a kill you now diagnosis. And somebody else mentioned foreign body. So you guys hit the money on that one. Those are the kill you now diagnosis that I'm thinking of. Um, and then three other less lethal diagnoses. I think you guys have covered... Um, this, maybe he's got an upper respiratory infection. Maybe he's got pneumonia, child abuse. I mean, child abuse could be on either one, but with kids, this is always, always, always on my mind. We don't let it slip because the minute we stop thinking about it is the minute we miss it. And this is the opportunity we have, especially in children or the elderly, the people that cannot advocate for themselves or seek help independently. It is up to us as providers to be looking out for things like this. And I have found it in some very unsuspecting situations. Um, and it was just all because it was on my mind. And this is, you know, it is our responsibility to always be looking for this, not to be morbid, just that that is something you don't wanna miss. And technically that could be on the kill you side now as well. Good differential. So for this guy, he has the exact same vital signs as the other man, our 70 year old. I wanna know is this good or bad? So his temperature is 97.6, heart rate is 101, blood pressure 78 over 44, respiration is 24, and he is satting 24%, good or bad? Mm, Savannah, good question. How do you know what's normal for a three-year-old? Yep. So this is the fun thing about pediatrics. It starts to get complex. So 18 and above, you consider adults generally. And we have a particular set of vital signs that are normal. However, for kids starting from birth, literally the first minute of birth, the acceptable vital signs in the first minute of birth are different than at five minutes of birth and at 10 minutes of birth. And then every few months, the acceptable and normal range of vital signs changes. So I carry a pediatric quick card on me because the vital signs that are okay for a one-year-old are not okay for a five-year-old. And the vital signs that are okay for a five-year-old are not okay for a 10-year-old. And they differ very much from adults. So, you know, the comment of depends on what's normal for him. E I'm not as much of a fan for that. People tell me that they, their body temperature normally runs a certain amount. And so certain other temperatures are a fever. What's normal for him depends on what's normal for his age. These vital signs are actually 100% normal for a three-year-old. So the same numbers and the same vital signs in a 70-year-old were abnormal and he was in shock, but the same vital signs in a three-year-old these are normal. I'm actually very happy to see these. Most of all, he's not hypoxic. He's not breathing too fast. This is a normal respiration. His blood pressure is actually perfect for a three-year-old. It's very good. And heart rate in children is higher. So very good. And he's not febrile. So 
that's why I carry a pediatric quick card and things get much more complicated with pediatrics because their vital signs are constantly changing. Once they start to get about 16, 18, then you can kind of apply the more adult vital signs to them. So he's good here. In general, he's in no acute distress. His um, HE and T exam, pupils are equally round and reactive to light and accommodation. He's got a little clear rhinorrhea, moist mucous membranes, a little bit of redness in the back of the throat. That's the mild pharyngeal erythema, but no exudates. So you don't see any pus back there. His uvula is midline. Does anybody know why I'm saying this? So in documentation, a pearl for documentation, you you've, may have heard this. If you didn't write it down, if you didn't document it, it didn't happen, okay? So in our documentation, you want to give pertinent positives, like the things that are abnormal that you notice, as well as the pertinent negatives, the things that you didn't see that matter. So um, uvula is midline, neck is non-tender, full range of uh, motion. So I'm telling you, he's got a little bit of erythema there, but no exudate. So what I'm saying is I don't think he has a bacterial pharyngitis. His uvula is midline. It, why would it not be midline? What is the diagnosis you can get where your uvula is off to the side? Because that's what I'm telling you by telling you it's midline. I'm telling you he does not have a peritonsillar abscess. When you have a peritonsillar abscess in the back of your throat, your uvula tends to deviate to the opposite side. Okay. Um, and then I'm telling you his neck is non tender, it's supple. He does not have meningitis, right? How do we get from shortness of breath to meningitis? This is clinical stuff you'll pick up over time, but especially in kids with any sort of respiratory complaints, these are the kind of diagnoses that you just have to consider um, and that he's got full range of motion, okay? So he doesn't have a retropharyngeal abscess either. Retropharyngeal abscess, people kind of walk like this, you know, they can't really bend their throats and that's more of a pediatric disease. Um, and some cervical lymphadenopathy. So he's got a little redness and he's got some lymph nodes in his throat. So it sounds like he's got some sort of a respiratory infection. Heart, regular rate rhythm, no murmurs, gallops and rubs, um, respiratory exam, um, symmetric expansion, symmetric, right? If it's asymmetric, you're thinking maybe he's got a pneumothorax on one side and he's got a little bit of expiratory wheezing bilaterally, okay? One thing I should have mentioned here is no strider. That's also really important, especially if we concern, we're concern concerned about foreign body or just to understand his respiratory status, like epiglottitis. Does he have strider? I didn't document it here, but that would be really important to say he doesn't have strider. <clears throat> GI exam, soft, non-distended, non-tender, no rebound, no guarding. Note, I didn't do a GU exam. We have very focused exams here. Shortness of breath, I don't really need to look at his genitals. To be honest, in my kids, if they're like two and under or they're below the age of being able to communicate with me, I do actually usually just take a quick peek, you know, make sure I don't miss any issues there. But, you know, a three-year-old shortness of breath, eh, unless there's, you know, I don't know that I need to do a GU. Neuro exam. He looks good, he's awake, he's alert, he's playful, follows directions, no focal deficits, and then he's got no rashes. So on the scale of sick versus not sick, with my, are the first patient being more on like the critically ill side, this is kind of a, a less sick patient. So that's good. What I'm gonna do for him, I'm suspecting he's got like a mild asthma exacerbation, um, probably because he didn't have any of his meds for the last month. So I'm gonna give him some duos, that's albuterol, ipratropium, um, some steroids as well. And then I wanna give him some time. So give him maybe three duos, give him steroids over the course of an hour and then reassess him because I'm not really sure. And my mind is thinking versus that other patient, I was like, okay, he's coming in, he's going to the OR, that's his dispo, dispo done. This patient needs a little bit of a work and reassessment. If he's doing okay, he's all right to go home, right? Because I think this is mild. If he's not improving or if he starts to worsen, I'm probably going to admit him or do some more interventions like get an x-ray or reassess and be like, okay, hang on, where am I? What information do I have? What has changed? Am I still on the right pathway? So we reassess him in an hour. He's doing great. He really just needed his meds, right? This is a three-year-old that's been without, of his, without his asthma meds. And that's probably why he had a mild exacerbation, maybe from a little cold that exacerbated it. 
So he's going to go home with some um, PO steroids. And of course, I'm going to refill all of his medications. On top of that, there's some thing, additional things I'm going to do. Anticipatory guidance. That means talking to mom and dad about what to expect in treating him over the next few days. So like if you go home and he starts wheezing, mom and dad might be like, oh my gosh, he's wheezing. We need to go right back to the emergency department. And I tell parents, you're always welcome in the ER, right? When it comes to kids, I don't care. I get it. I have kids and you'd rather be safe than sorry. You're always welcome in my ER. No judgment. We will always take care of your kid. But in a kid who has an asthma exacerbation, who needs his nebs around the clock, he needs steroids. It's going to take a couple of days to get better. I'm going to let them know like, hey, you're going to go home. He might wheeze a little bit. That's okay. If he wheezes, Give, an al give him an albuterol treatment, okay? If it doesn't get better, or if he starts you know, turning blue, or if, if he's having a real hard time breathing, I'll tell them what retractions are. I'll tell them what strider are. Those, you know, bring him back immediately. Those are the things I want you to watch out for and bring him back. That's what strict return precautions are. Make sure your parents understand this. I mean, not just parents, anyone you're discharging, I tell them exactly why to come back. And then I always follow up with, or if you're worried, come back anytime, we'll reassess you. And then I want to make sure he has close peds follow up. So if it's the daytime, I'll call his pediatrician and be like, hey, you know, they couldn't get their meds refilled. I don't understand why, but I want you to make sure you're watching out for this family because these are the things, you know, better care outside of the ER or trying to close that loop outside of the ER. Will kid keep this kid outside of the ER? And data shows us that the kids that go to the ER with asthma exacerbation more often end up having worse disease. And it's a handful of like, yes, if you have more moderate severe asthma, you may visit the ER more often. But many times it's also true that people that are not able to coordinate care outside of the ER very well are going to end up coming to the ER more often. And if you're more sick when you come to the ER, you're going to end up getting more treatment. God forbid you get so sick, you need to be intubated, you need to be hospitalized. In general, you're going to do worse with your asthma than if you're able to keep it controlled outside of the ER. And that doesn't mean don't come to the ER, but just we want to coordinate care the best that we can. And this is where I think the patient advocacy part comes in too. Like, hey, just watch out for this patient a little bit closer. I'm not saying it was unnecessary, but had he had his meds for the last month, he might not have needed to come to the ER. Um, and then I'll consult social work um, to work with mom as to, you know, what, what, you know, just helping mom to get the medication. Was it an insurance issue? Is it that, you know, she works so much? Let's say she's a night shift worker. I totally get that. And she can't, you know, so she's always working nights, sleeping during the day, and she can't get into the office because the office is only open during the day. Like, how can we help to coordinate? So sometimes we, you can just see the range of work that we're doing from the last patient that I had to this patient. You just got a broad scope of acuity, um, presentations, pathology, and then what you're actually doing for the patients. Where'd I go? So pearls, um, I did not get an x-ray in this patient. I don't get an x-ray in all of my pediatric short of breaths, but the, here are the pearls, here are the four, Fs of when you should get an x-ray in a pediatric asthma exacerbation. Someone you know has asthma, who presents like asthma, um, and you're pretty sure it's asthma. They don't all need chest x-rays. We don't need to radiate everybody for no reason. If you're going to do it, this is why you would do it. If you're worried that there's a foreign body, okay, like, ooh, he's only got wheezes on the right side, but not the left side. Or like, you know, he was two years old. Mom said he was playing with his Legos and she went to go get something, something from the kitchen. She came back and he was in respiratory distress, right? Foreign body. If he's got a fever and you're concerned about a pneumonia, okay, get the x-ray. If he fails to improve. So, you know, if I gave him his duonabs, I gave him his steroids, I came back in an hour and he's doing worse, or he hasn't gotten better, I'm gonna be like, oh, that's unusual, right? Because if it's asthma, he should have gotten better with the interventions that I did. If he didn't, I'd be like, okay, now let me, you know, now let me get an x-ray, let me go to the next step. And then if there's any sort of fracture or suspicion of trauma or abuse, um, get, get the x-ray. So, oop. You've seen the patient, you come out of that room, your huff go, you know, the nurses are like, great job, doctor, cool. We have a code rolling in in four minutes. Cards is on the phone waiting to talk to you about a patient they're sending 
in and there's 22 patients in the waiting room. So let's go. So that's what it is, a little glimpse into what I do in the ER every day or every however many days a month. Here are just some general pearls, advice I have for you. Anybody pursuing a career in medicine, as you go through your medical training, learn a proper exam. I hope somebody teaches you this. Don't let go of this. I still do this. Not everybody does this, but it drives me nuts. Undress the patient. Patients don't like taking their clothes off. They don't understand. They're here for toe pain and I'm telling them to take all their clothes off. Maybe not toe pain, but yeah, even toe pain because I'm gonna examine that whole freaking leg. I wanna feel your femoral pulses. I wanna look all the way from your waist all the way down to your toe. For them, it's just toe pain. For me, undress the patient. I want to see head to toe. Chest pain, I've seen this miss. Someone's got chest pain. When you do this EKG, you get the chest x-ray, you get the, you know, the troponin, you do all of this stuff. But had you looked at their chest, you notice it's just herpes zoster. They just have shingle. And now you, you just did this whole unnecessarily, you know, unnecessary and totally unrelated workup for chest pain that had nothing to do with the cardiac system. It was a skin issue. He has shingles. Always undress your patients. I've also seen with like somebody with leg pain and they have their pants on. Take the pants off. How do you know if they have a DVT or not, right? Like you can't even look at their legs. Please undress the patient. Um, as you're studying, this is something I struggled with, but find and stick with good study habits. I found out I study best alone. Everybody always studied in groups and I tried it and it just did not work for me, but they're not kidding about lifelong learning friends. I am still studying. I'm going to be studying for the rest of my life. Although I've passed all my board exams, I am board certified. I'll certify again in 10 years. All, there is always something to learn. You will never know everything and that's okay. The sooner you realize that, I think the more freeing it is because I would be so overwhelmed with the amount of things you need to know. I have my most useful clinical guides always in my pocket, ready to go um, to reference, but I know how I study. It took me a while to come around to that. I mentioned I took my MCAT twice. I took post back classes to build up my GPA. And in that path, I found out what works for me and that's the way I stick with it. Try different methods and just see what works for you. What works for you may not be what works for your friend next to you. And that's okay. You gotta do what's best for you. Be honest with yourself about what you do and do not like as you go through your clinical rotations, as you're thinking about what specialty you want to pursue. Glamour and money do not always equal happiness. And if you're going to be in this pathway with this lifelong commitment to medicine, um, it's grueling, it is costly, it is taxing mentally and physically and financially. At the end of the day, you deserve to be happy in the work that you're doing. Fit medicine into your real life. It also took me probably until I was in attending to understand this. So the sooner you can try to incorporate this, I think the better it is just for your life. I was just trying to be like, oh, I'm in medicine all the time. And then trying to do other things like fitting my life into medicine. No, it's the other way around. You are so much more than medicine, although you dedicate your life to this. Make sure you pay attention to the rest of your life, even if you miss holidays and important events. Medicine is a part of your life. You are always so much more than what you are doing and that you are studying, even when it doesn't feel like it, just don't forget to take care of the other aspects of your life. Your own health, um, your own personal life, your, the people you care about, and your interests and your hobbies. Keep up with that. As you know, I think we mentioned briefly, so I had breast cancer last year. I didn't talk about that much, but at the beginning of pan the pandemic, March, the first week when the pandemic was announced, that's the same um, week I was diagnosed. So I've been out on medical disability. I was out for about uh, 18 months. I went through chemo. I went through a couple surgeries. I've been back at work now for maybe three months. But if that wasn't a wake up call as to take care of yourself, I don't know what is. And I don't want anybody else to have to have that experience to understand that. So trust me when I say you come first, you cannot do your work, you can't do it adequately or appropriately without you being healthy and happy mentally and physically. So put yourself first. 
regarding finances, which um, physicians are in a very unique position, financially speaking, relating to some of the medical debt, excuse me, student loans and student debt that we can accrue going through education, as well as our lower pay compared to the jump, you know, massive jump in pay that we have as attendings, the white coat investor, oh, it is so helpful. Traditional financial advice doesn't really apply to us because we're in a very unique financial situation. So read it. I think I didn't read it till residency, read it in med school, read it before med school. If you're a resident now, read it now. It's never too early or too late to read this book and kind of reference it um, as to how to get your finances in order. Hold your head up high, but not too high. Please, please be humble, be kind, and listen. Don't dare go to the nurse your first day out of medical school and say anything snarky like, I am the doc, just don't do that. I rely on the nurses and the best thing I ever did, I'm sure people will give you this advice, be really nice to your nurses. I think I went in and I was like, hi, I'm Dr. Jackson. Like, can you help me? Like ask them for their help. Oh my God, game changer. You want your nurses, you want your techs, you want your clerks, you want them all on your side because you are on a team, don't alienate them. Don't be the big, bad, blah, 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 blah. No, the best thing about my job is the people that I work with and the support that I have and how we can come together and really save lives. And it's amazing, those relationships. So don't alienate them. We have different skill sets. Nobody is better than anybody else. And I literally, literally cannot do my job without my support staff. I am nobody without them. I can sit at the computer, see my patients, put in all the orders, but nothing happens. They're the ones that make it happen. And I really trust them. A lot of them actually have more clinical experience than I do. And once you get to that trusting relationship, oh my gosh, it is amazing how much you can trust them. And they will pick up on things, especially in the ER, because they spend much more time with the patients than I do. So if my nurses say something, I listen. I go to the bedside, I reassess, and they will catch things that I have missed. Um, and they have helped me out so much. The more you help them and be kind to them, they it will come back tenfold. So have some confidence, but don't be a jerk. If you are interested in emergency medicine, so we'll transition, I think this is my last slide, we'll transition into questions after this. Here are some resources. So the Emergency Medicine EMRA Residency Association, excellent website with some clinical resources. The American College of Emergency Physicians. Um, and here is my email address at the bottom, a blog. I'm a writer outside of um, the emergency department. I write for medical education. I write personal stuff. Um, and then also follow me on Instagram. My content primarily there is like breast cancer as well as emergency medicine related. When you get onto your clinical rotations, um, here are some really good phone apps. PDSTAT, um, for anybody who may potentially at any point see kids, get PDSTAT. It's amazing. It's free, I believe. The EMRA antibiotic guide, I use it every day. Pharmacy, pharmaceuticals, and oh gosh, antibiotics is so not my thing. I do a lot of antibiotics and I use my guide um, a lot. I believe that's a $10 app. Um, E-Res, I think that's still active. And then PEPID, P-E-P-I-D. I don't remember what it stands for, but it's another um, really good phone app. And now that we have access to these things um, at our fingertips, of course, learn your medicine and know it. And then use these references if you are able to. And especially as you're learning, it's nice to quick reference them. And I'm gonna take some questions now. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. If anyone has any questions, they can feel free to ask now and we'll now begin our Q&A session. Thank you very much for that incredibly informative session, Dr. Jackson. My name is Hamza and I'm attending a joint BSDO program in yes. University and Lake Erie, College, uh, Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine, both in Pennsylvania. Awesome. To start off our Q&A, what is the difference between shock trauma and emergency medicine? Yes, okay. So emergency medicine, you kind of got the flavor from me. I think like we staff the emergency departments, people come in with complaints of chest pain, whatever, 
and we do this whole assessment, we do a certain amount of procedures. Now, a trauma surgeon, I think that may be what you're referring to as shock trauma. So shock trauma is, a, you know, as you know, in University of Maryland, it's in Baltimore, it's a training center. Shock trauma or trauma surgeons, they are primarily surgeons. So they could go through a general surgery um, resident, you know, they go to medical school, then they go to a surgical residency, then they go to a trauma fellowship after that, and they primarily are doing surgical work. So they don't work in the emergency department. They are for us a consultant. They generally work in a trauma center. So my hospital is not a trauma center. We don't have trauma surgeons. I only have general surgeons. So where I trained in Philadelphia, North Philadelphia, we work together in the emergency department, the trauma center. If we had a gunshot wound come in, you know, GSW to the um, chest, we will call a level one trauma alert. The trauma surgeon comes down. We work together to stabilize the patient. We put in the lines. I will intubate the patient. I will give the meds. Um, if they code, we run the code together. And then if they need surgery, that's when the trauma surgeon takes over, takes them up to the operating room. If they don't need surgery, but they're critically ill, they're coming into the surgical ICU, they get admitted, the trauma surgeon then does the management. So I can do everything in the ER, we come together to work on trauma patients, and then the surgeon will take over for any sort of intervention they need. If it was just like a graze wound into the arm and the patient can go home, trauma surgeon says, okay, great, we don't need to intervene with them, I will take the patient back. I, you know, will clean the wound, figure out the wound, prescribe them antibiotics, send them home, and then they'll see the surgeon um, in a week. So we come together to work on trauma patients, but they're primarily surgeons and we are primarily um, staffing the ER. I hope that clarifies. Yeah, thank you, that answers your question. Our next question is how often are antimicrobial sutures used for laceration management? That's such a specific question. I've never used one. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> The next question we have, uh, what are some different types of sutures you use in the ER? Oh, this is, oh, someone's like really into sutures. Okay. I'm an ethylon girl. I really don't use much, much different than ethylon. That's like what I trained on. And for the purposes of what I'm suturing, um, you know, we don't generally do the absorbables. I'm doing more like superficial lacerations and things like that. I, I go the ethylon route. That's just my preferred, you know, and then I'll go from like 5.0 to 2.0, just depending on where we're suturing and what the wound looks like. For the answer. I understand that many ER resident physicians perform ultrasounds on, the, on their own patients. Yes. There, are there any advantages of taking ultrasound yourself over POCUS for investigation? So POCUS is, just to clarify, point of care ultrasound is me ultrasounding. That is ER physicians ultrasounding. It is a, it is included in our residency training now because um, we do it so often. So the advantages of me doing my POCUS versus getting a study from radiology is that it's quicker. I get my diagnosis and I get my answer and my patient doesn't have to go anywhere. So I'll give you a clinical example. I had this um, patient, she had cancer, she had known pericardial effusion in the past and she was there with um, shortness of breath and she was hypotense. So mm, I'm worried she had a cardiac um, tamponade, right? So all I did, wheeled my ultrasound in there, threw it on her heart. And I was like, okay, she's got cardiac tamponade. Five minutes later, I was on the phone with thoracic surgery and she went to the OR to get a pericardial window. So those are the benefits of she didn't have, I didn't, it was in the middle of the night too. So one, I didn't have to call in the ultrasound tech. Two, I didn't have to wait three hours for that study to be done. And that kind of mattered in an unstable patient. Um, so really time, I think is the biggest benefit there. Oh, and then also, sorry, using ultrasound for prestigious. I do that all the time. If I'm putting in lines, it's a very hypotense patient, you know, uh, and for rapid assessment, there's different things, you know, like the FAST exam or the um, RUSH exam is for hypotense patients. I can look at their IVC. I can look at their heart. I can look at their aorta, look for free fluid, kind of understand why they're hypotense and guide my treatment that way. And those exams, actually, radiology techs don't do. Those are just ER physician exams. Uh, thank you. Our next question is a retroport, oh, my bad, retroperitoneal hemorrhage doesn't show up on fast scan. So how do you diagnose it? Yeah, so a retroperitoneal hemorrhage that would need to be on a CT. So for that example, like if this guy's AAA had ruptured, right? 
So let's say um, I did my fast exam, it's negative, and I'm like, okay, fine. I know the aorta is in the back. I'm not going to see free fluid. And he is too unstable. His blood pressure is too low. I'm worried he's going to code. I'm not sending him to the CAT scan. I can ultrasound him and I'll be like, oh, shoot, his aorta is seven centimeters. I'm going to call the vascular surgeon and be like, look, I got this 70 year old, multiple risk factors. He's got a seven centimeter aorta. Um, I'm worried he has a triple A. He's got pulse deficits, unstable for the CAT scan, and that then he'll likely go to the operating room just based on that information. All right, thank you for the example. Mm -hmm. uh, next question is, what is the immediate prognosis of cardiac arrest patients who have been resuscitated? The immediate prognosis, like... It all depends. I know that answer sucks, but it really all depends. If you're talking about like a 70, like this patient, our aorta patient, let's say it wasn't the aorta, but he had cardiac arrest. It was like pneumonia. Depending on their age, their comorbidities, what was their cardiac arrest rhythm? Was it like a shockable rhythm or a non-shockable? How long were they in cardiac arrest? All of that matters. Older, if they were PEA, asystole, non-shockable rhythm, cardiac arrest for much longer, getting ROSC, they will do okay. The majority, I think the majority have some serious neurologic deficits and their longer term prognosis, they're kind of in some more, I hate to use vegetable, but more vegetative states with a lot of neurologic deficits versus talking about a 40 year old in V-fib arrest, like a shockable rhythm who got shocked and was in cardiac arrest for five minutes, they're gonna do a lot better. Immediate prognosis, generally most people don't wake up right away. So it's more like the long-term prognosis that we care about, but younger person, fewer core morbidities, shorter cardiac arrest time, shockable rhythm, they're gonna do better. Thanks for the answer. Um, our next question is, how do emergency medicine physicians treat conditions or complications if there isn't a known cause, their cause are idiopathic. Yeah, so I never label, so idiopathic is not the same as um, unknown cause. Idiopathic means that we caused it. Someone explained this to me in med school. It's like idiopathic, like we're the idiots, we caused it, right? So if somebody got an EGD and they got perforated from the EGD, that's an idiopathic perf. It was a complication of the procedure. I, oh, I'm so sorry. Actually, that is iatrogenic. Idiopathic meaning idiots, we don't know how it happened. Okay, I get what you're saying. Iatrogenic meaning we caused it. See, I got to remind myself of this stuff all the time. Um, so idiopathic, that happens. A lot of people that I send home, I will tell them like, I don't know what is causing your symptoms, but in the ER, my, my purpose being evaluating for you for a life-threatening disease, you have to set expectations. My job is not to find a diagnosis. My job is to make sure that you don't have a life-threatening diagnosis. So sometimes people come to the ER, they're like, oh, I have belly pain. Like, what is it? What is it? And I'm like, well, you got a CAT scan. It's not this. It's not this. It's not this. It's not this. I can't tell you what it is, but I don't find any abnormalities. Right now you're stable enough to go home. Here's the reasons to come back. See your primary care doctor for additional testing because my testing is not comprehensive. My testing is very focused for life-threatening etiologies. And if it's not one of those, I'm less worried. You go home and continue down the outpatient pathway. And that's exactly what I tell patients. I don't want them to think like, oh, I went to the ER. They told me it was nothing. They couldn't find a cause. It doesn't mean it's nothing. Just I have not identified a life-threatening problem. So it needs additional evaluation. All right, got it. Thanks for that answer. Uh, do you do you feel like do you feel like you normally have enough time to counsel patients even during busy days in the ER? I never have enough time, but I do it because it's the right thing to do. <laughs> They'll never feel it will never feel like I have enough time, <laughs> but it's it's so important. Um, and having that discussion with your patients, making sure they understand it's everything. So. All right. Thank you very much for answering the questions that I've asked so far. I'll now be passing it over to Amna to ask the remainder of our questions. Thank you, Hamza. Um, how do, our next question is, how do you stay up to date on your research for novel treatments of COVID-19 or other cases you regularly see in the ER? Yeah, so I, 
I'm not even going to show you behind me. I have a variety of medical journals. I'm subscribed to a lot of foam, free open access, free open access medicine. I have a lot of recess resources and um, CME. So you have CME, um, continuing medical education requirements. I think I do 50 credits a year. So I'm constantly like attending conferences, reading journals, reading new articles. And through work, we have new guidelines and algorithms. Uh, that's, how, that's how I keep up. Um, with different things. And as clinical scenarios come up, I kind of take note of them and I'll go research them later or research on shift. If something comes up and I'm like, oh, this is kind of weird. I don't know how to deal with this. Right then and there, I'll stop and um, go research. Thank you. And how is the COVID-19 Delta variant different from the other variants you have seen and present presented in the ER? And is it possible that it may cause new shutdowns if it is more novel and infectious? Oh, this is a great question. So I'm not a COVID-19 expert, although I do work a lot with COVID-19. What I will say is so far in my management in the ER, when we're dealing with COVID, I can't even tell you if it's Delta or not. When I see patients and it's in their very first few hours, I just suspect that it's COVID. I don't even have testing for Delta variant or not. So I can't even tell you what the differences are in the Delta variant patients versus the not. And now we have the new variant coming up. I may have dealt with all three of them, I probably have, but I don't know because I don't even have that testing in the ER. So in the first few hours, I don't know. And what I do know is COVID is rising again. And in our patients who are unvaccinated, they are the more critically ill patients. They do much far worse than the vaccinated patients. Thank you. And given that emergency medicine is a specialty that pushes for more women and other underrepresented minorities to pursue, is it more difficult during emergency medicine residency to get maternity leave? Oh, no, not at all. So you, I'm the right person for this because I took two maternity leaves in my emergency residency. I think I'm the first and only person that's done that in my program. And now there's more women after me that have done that. So I'm really excited about that. When I was interviewing for residency programs, um, I didn't tell anybody that that was my plan, but that was somebody I, something I was looking for as I went through my interviews. What's a program where I feel like that would be supported and that would fit in? I had an amazing residency director who was very supportive. I had my own plan. So I got an intern year. I got pregnant. I told my program director after I got pregnant and we adjusted my schedule accordingly. My co-residents were amazing. I took um, six weeks off. I know that's not a lot of time. People have it far worse, but I took six weeks off. I adjusted my schedule around it and then I came back. And then a year later, I was pregnant again. I told her after I got pregnant, we adjusted my schedule again. My co-residents were amazing. I took all of my rotations. That time I took um, eight weeks off. So a total of 14 weeks off I took in residency to have both of my daughters. Now I delayed my graduation by those 14 weeks. That might matter to some people. For me, I really didn't care. Instead of graduating on July 1st, I graduated on August 14th of 2019. I found a job just the same. I personally had no issues. What it, was it challenging? Hell yes. Was it crazy? Yeah but it's what I wanted to do and I was able to make it work. I also had a lot of support and I was in a really good program that allowed me to do that. So like I said, it's not about fitting your life into medicine. You are fitting medicine into your life. It works the other way around. Be the person that you are in your real life and make your medicine life work for you, okay? Don't ever flip it around, otherwise you will become a slave to medicine and that's just not, that's not right. You want to keep your life. Thank you. And what do you think was the hardest part of your journey to get where you are? And what do you think we should look out for? Honestly, this, I don't know if this will resonate with you. So everything was challenging, right? Like you get through one thing, you get through your MCAT and you're like, oh my gosh, I got to med school. I made it. And then I was like, oh my God, med school is so hard. Uh, and then I'm like, okay, I got to residency. I made it. And then, you know, obviously I had my kids and just residency. I was like, oh my gosh, residency is challenging. And then I was like, all right, I'm an attending. I made it. Attending life is so challenging. And obviously then I was diagnosed with breast cancer and my life flipped upside down. I think the hardest time for me actually was the pre-medical time because you are just working so hard, as much as you think you know what you're getting into, not to scare you, but you really don't know what you're getting into unless you're 
further until you further get into it, which is totally fine. But I was discouraged. I was so discouraged. I was like working my butt off, but really discouraged. I didn't do well with my MCAT. My classes weren't going well. And I had a really challenging time because I wanted to be a physician. I wanted to do clinical medicine and I wanted to help people. And I didn't understand why the heck I needed organic chemistry and PCAM and like learning about the oxygen molecules and what the heck that had to do with what I actually do on a daily basis. Um, I still don't know that it helped me in any way, but you have to get through those classes um, in order to get to where you are now. So it was a confusing and challenging time. So I'd say pre-medical time for me was really hard. At least once you get to med school, you can start seeing patients, start talking about what feels like clinical medicine and like what you're actually trying um, to do. So it's challenging, but it gets more interesting and you get to do what you were trying to do. Thank you. And how do you advocate for physicians who have also become patients with any medical conditions themselves? Yeah, so I do, I'm starting actually a cancer coaching business next year, but I do, I coach and mentor people mostly through social media or however we may connect. I help them um, with their disability paperwork, just navigating that work life balancing balance and prioritizing yourself. Um, and we also talk a lot about identity. It's very challenging, I think, for us as purveyors of health and caretakers when we're in a position that we're a patient. It's a very difficult identity to understand and grapple with. So I do some coaching, mentoring um, around that aspect and advocacy for people to prioritize themselves in their lives and kind of some of the conversations that we are having um, right now and I can support people in that way. Thank you. And sort of related to that topic, do you believe there needs to be more mental health resources dedicated for physicians due to the daily stress-inducing work environment, especially now given the pandemic? 100%. And people are working on this, I know. Um, yes, 100%. Absolutely, because we give everything for our patients and sometimes to the point that, you know, you give all of yourself to the point that it takes a toll on you, but we don't stop because that's just the mindset we have, right? Like you, you know, but we, it, it's hard to learn the point of like to take care of yourself and prioritize yourself first um, and to make sure that you're doing that because without you functioning optimally, you will not care for your patients optimally. Um, so it actually does nobody good if you're being harmed in the process. So yeah, 100%. This is something that is coming to attention and it's more in light now in, me in medicine and medical education. And there's a lot of work to be done there. Thank you. As you mentioned, a few fellowships within emergency medicine. Did you pursue an emergency medicine fellowship to specialize further? No, I did not. I'm not... Um, I didn't go to fellowship. I came straight out of um, residency. I'm community emergency medicine, so I don't have any um, specialties beyond that. I wanted to Got get it. paid right away. And what are what are some resources and advice you have for students currently preparing for the MCAT or USMLEs? Yes. Okay. So I actually did the. Um, I can't remember, it was Kaplan or I can't remember one of the review courses. And this is just me personally now. I did the review course. I attended all the classes, did all the work. I took my first MCAT. I think it's scored differently now. So I probably essentially failed it was what my score was. Then I went to my post back classes. I figured out how to study myself, which was I like to just study by myself. I read, I highlight the crap out of everything and practice questions, practice questions, practice questions, practice questions. As you go to med school, practice questions, practice questions, practice questions, every single board exam, the best thing you can do, take practice questions. That was the most helpful thing for me. And then take practice tests for the MCAT. You will have access or you can get access to practice tests. I would take one a week in the few months leading up to my MCAT. And it's not just taking the test. I spent four times the amount that I took the test. I spent four, you know, it took me two hours to take the test. I would end up spending eight hours going back and looking at every single question. If I got it right, okay, fine. Made sure I understood. If I got it wrong, what did I get wrong? Where was the error in my thought process? What can you learn? That is the most useful thing you can do. So don't just look at your score and be like, oh, okay. No, go look at what you got wrong and that's how you will learn. So the next time a question comes up like that, 
you know exactly what to do. Thank you. That's a really effective study plan. How do you manage the very random hours and ensure you feel energized and well rested for multiple night shifts? Coffee. <laughs> I do. Um, I have a bizarre sleep schedule. I actually schedule my sleep in. So sometimes, you know, it's just about scheduling and sleep. I have caffeine and I try to take care of myself outside. So sleeping, exercise, time with my kids, like, you know, things that get my endorphins running, get my, you know, serotonin running, that kind of stuff. So if I, for instance, if I'm going into a night shift, um, let's say whatever day it is, I will wake up 730, take my kids to school, and then I will try to sleep all day while they're in school. I just get right back into my bed, sleep for a couple more hours. Um, or if I have stuff to do, I'll just stay awake and sleep the next day and make sure I schedule and sleep that day. Um, so it's, it's, I literally just schedule sleep on my calendar, sleep when I can, sleep often, um, and caffeine. I'm not saying that's the best advice. That's just how I manage. <laughs> Thank you. And for our last question, how do you manage your work-life balance? Oh my gosh, that's like a whole one hour session in and of itself. Um, Google Calendar is my best friend. Um, what I do, I have my work schedule. As soon as I get my work schedule, I go to make my childcare arrangements between my nanny and my family and their school. I get everything on a Google Calendar that everybody can see. Then I'll schedule in my sleep. Then I will schedule in my, um, you know, the, uh, the work that I do outside of my work, whether it's writing or coaching or what, you know, my exercise, I do a lot of stuff on my calendar. Then I try to make sure like at least once a month, I'm doing something social. It ends up being more than once a month, honestly, like that I'm going out to see my friends and I'm going out of the house, you know, COVID safe, but I'm doing something social, make sure I'm exercising, but scheduling is, is the way I make it work. Um, and I schedule in downtime as well. Like last night was a downtime for me. It's like the first time, I mean, since August and we're almost halfway into September, I had an evening to myself and I purposely scheduled nothing. I just sat on my couch in a horizontal position for as long as possible as part of my recovery. Um, so yeah, just Google calendar. Thank you so much for answering our questions, Dr. Jackson. Those are all of our questions for today. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Reach out, Instagram, email me. I'm happy to talk, mentor, review, whatever you would like. And best of luck to everybody. Bye. Hi. Thank you very much, Dr. Jackson. We really of appreciate course. you taking the time to answer all of our questions. It was a greatly informative learning session for all of us. Uh, and I love you. everyone to please give a warm thank you to Dr. Jackson in the chat box oh. for this incredibly informative session. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye. Once again, thank you so much, Dr. Jackson, for such an interactive and informative session. Um, now we're going to conduct our closing session with our quiz and future session dates. The link to the quiz for this session is now live. Um, again, you'll need a 70% or higher to pass and receive your certification. And don't forget to join our mailing list if you haven't already, as we send session and quiz reminders right to your mailbox. You can join from the link that's being sent in the chat below now. And now we're going to move on to our next session dates. These dates will also be posted throughout our social media outlets, so be sure to follow us at Teleshadowing. And I'm looking forward to seeing you all at our next session, which is next Saturday on September 18th at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time with our physician who's mentoring us in pediatrics. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending today's session, and we hope to see you in upcoming sessions as well. This concludes this week's shadowing. <laughs>